everyone and welcome to daily newspaper analysis which is presented to you by Law Seco. Today we will discuss two articles. The first article is from the Hindu which is titled as a low carbon future through sector led change. So this article talks about the prospects of becoming a net zero country and what are the challenges that can be seen in this particular regard. The second article is from the Indian Express which is titled as on red turf standing ground. So this article talks about the various theories that are popular behind the idea of Naxalism and in India, what can be the possible reasons that the Naxalism specifically in the state of Chhattisgarh exists till date. And finally, we have the news in flash column. Before moving further, let's have a look at the project Maverick, which is almost free CLAT preparation course from Law Seco. So if you are preparing for CLAT 2021 or 2022, you can enroll yourself for this course at just a cost of rupees 100. The link to this course is available in the description box below. With this, let's see what is the multiple choice question from yesterday's discussion. Ingenuity, the Mars helicopter belongs to, your options are India, USA, China, or Israel. You can write down your answer in the comment section below. Also, for all those who want to download the PDF of today's slides, you can check out the link of our Telegram group in the description box. Please be assured that this link is definitely the correct one and you will be getting the right updates daily regarding the PDFs of these slides. So please join our Telegram group. Also, let's see what is the descriptive question from the day. What do you understand by Naxalism? How can this problem be uprooted from the country? You can write down your answer in a maximum of 250 to 300 words. On this note, let's start a discussion for the first article for the day, which is the sector led low carbon future. So this article basically talks about that we need to have an increase in discussion on whether India should announce a net zero emissions target. Now, as we know that many countries, specifically if we talk about various European countries like the United Kingdom, France, etc., have announced to become net zero by the coming half of the century. Now, for this, we need to understand as to what do we mean by becoming a net zero emissions country? Does it mean that we should totally reduce or totally put down any kinds of carbon emissions from our country? No, please note that being net zero does not mean that we would produce a, a zero kind of an emission. Rather, it means that we make sure that the amount of emissions, specifically the emissions of the carbon and the other greenhouse gases, whatever emissions is done by the country or by the industries or any kind of sources from that country, we have sufficient sources so that particular emissions can also be absorbed in the same amount. Let's say, for example, if the industries, transportation, animal husbandry, etc., in India, they are producing a total of 100 units of carbon, then we should have such possible ways, like we should have the forests, we should have other kinds of technological advances, wherein exactly the amount of 100 units of these greenhouse gases can also be absorbed back. So ultimately, in the long run, the zero, the emission, the total emission of the country would become out or it would turn out to be net zero. That is the real meaning of having a net zero emissions target. So if you talk about the net zero in detail, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the IPCC report, called for the global emissions to reach net zero by 2050. So it says that if at all we need to control the climate change and also the global warming at, in, at, at the fastest rate, then the global emissions should reach out to net zero by maximum of 2050. And thus, it requires some countries reaching net zero before 2050. Now, because obviously the rate or the emissions done by the countries are not same and equal. And that is why it is said, according to this IPCC report, that some countries would even need to reach out to the net zero even before 2050. Thus, large emission is done by the developed countries. Now, many a times we have also discussed about being equitable and distributing the responsibility of carbon emission or reducing the carbon emission on an equitable and just basis, because it is seen that developed countries like USA, etc., they are the ones that contribute the largest to the carbon emissions. Whereas other countries, let's say example of the African countries, they though they face the largest brunt due to the climate change and such geographical reasons, but still they contribute very minimalistic to the global emissions of the carbon and other greenhouse gases. 
and that is why even the responsibility to reduce the carbon emission should also be done as per the emission which is done by that particular country and thus the onus falls largely on the developed countries so india being a vulnerable country to climate change also needs to contribute to limiting temperature now as we know that the target is to stop the temperature or the global temperature maximum at 2 to 2.5 degrees celsius but uh, for that purpose we need to see that india also is a country that is highly vulnerable to such climate change as we know that these days the floods then various kinds of other disasters in the country like you know the glacial floods landslides etc there are all the reasons many a times due to the climate change and that is why india also needs to take a step forward to contribute to limit the temperature at the global level now here are some steps that have been suggested in this article with strict timelines that should be taken up to achieve a net zero emissions target firstly we should focus on concrete near term sectoral transformations through aggressive adoption of technologies and avoid high carbon lock ins with this it means that the virtue or the nature of the industries transport system etc should be such that every sector should now be contributing lesser for the carbon emissions a good example of this is the idea of bringing the electric vehicles now as we say that by the year 2030 we have a target of having at least 30% of the total means of transportation being the electric vehicles so this would be a kind of a sectoral transformation similarly if we say that we should reduce the dependency on the coal for the emissions in the industry then that also is a kind of a sectoral transformation so these should be taken up more aggressively that is very strictly in the entire sectors of the industries the sector the second one is sectoral low carbon development combined with job creation competitiveness distributive justice and low pollution in the key areas so obviously this connects to the first point itself that along with this thing wherein we try to reduce the emissions done by the industries transportation etc we should not forget that it is equally important to create jobs to enhance competitiveness and also to distribute justice and to pr produce all the areas and let's uh, say to have least population from the key areas also it says that we should make efforts to decarbonize the power, power sector so it says that the power sector which is the largest source of greenhouse gases approximately at 40% so this will actually help in urbanization and the industrial development at a less cost of the environment and thus as we just discussed we should try to limit the coal power which should reach the peak coal electricity capacity by 2030 and thus in such a scenario we should make coal based energy cleaner and more efficient and also it says that we should improve the energy services and we should enhance efficiency of the use of electricity wherein we say when a lot of electricity and power is lost specifically in the distribution of the electricity and that is why the electricity cannot be used very efficiently so we should firstly use it very efficiently and further we should look out for more renewable sources like the hydropower solar power etc for the enhancement or for the production of the electricity then this article also says that it is necessary to create a multi stakeholder just transition commission which would represent at all the levels the different sectors and levels of the government which will definitely increase the coherence and interconnectivity of various sectors of the government with this let's discuss the second article for the day which talks about the popular theories behind the maoist attacks so it says that it again highlights the recent maoist attacks which were taken place in sukma district of chatisgarh please be uh, careful that whenever we are using the terms maoist naxalist etc these are referring to the same problem but the only thing is that they are referred to as different terms in different parts of the country so this article says that the most popular theory focuses on the socio economic causes that drive support to the naxal movements now when we try to understand that what are the reasons why naxalism exists specifically in the areas or in the states of bihar west bengal chatisgarh uh, odisha etc so the, many a times the biggest reason that is attributed to the growth of naxalism is the socio economic cause so we say that they are taken aloof from the society they're not you know treated equally along with the uh, different people and also they are not listened to and thus their demands are not being fulfilled that is why they take up the route of being of becoming the naxals but let's understand that what are these problems with the pop this popular theory firstly it supports the ideological foundations of the movement and rejects the indian constitution now if at all we look carefully we know that the indian constitution provides equal rights to every citizen of the country 
there is no division or there is no any kind of differentiation whatsoever between any person be it a rich person or a poor one be it one who belongs to the city or to a rural area or even to a jungle area and thus it is sheer negligence that we do not consider that the indian constitution is equal for everybody and yet there is a demand and there is an ideology that the naxalists or those who favor the naxalism are not treated equally at the socio economic par and thus it is important to understand that the constitution has been making ever ending endeavors to put forward the interests of all the people that is why specifically if you know we also have the national commission for the scheduled castes we have the national commission for scheduled tribes and also there are various specific reservations also which are provided specifically to the scs and sts and obcs and thus the constitution has been making ever ending endeavors and efforts to put all the people equally and thus this thing that says that the socio economic causes actually are the driving reason for the naxalist naxalist movements definitely holds no ground here and also it fails to see that socio economic deprivation is not unique to the jungles of chatisgarh now specifically as we said that the problem of naxalism or maoism is specifically enhancing and it is ever increasing in the state of chatisgarh so if at all we consider that if there are any issues if at all yes they exist maybe in the practical grounds there are some socio economic depri deprivations that can be seen but it is not the case that only the jungles of chatisgarh are the one that suffer due to these socio economic deprivations there are various other states let's say for example uttar pradesh and bihar west bengal as well wherein such socio economic deprivations were seen but yet the problem of naxalism has reduced over the period of years but still the problem of chatisgarh has not been resolved till date which ultimately gives us a hint that perhaps there is some other reason or there is some other purpose behind these naxalist movements just not and it's not just the socio economic causes also the role of external forces in fomenting and sustaining this movement is deliberately underplayed now as we say that many a times the reason is not something which comes from within rather there are also various external reasons there are also various other forces that deliberately try to you know uh, put forward this thing and they deliberately try so that some kind of disturbance is always maintained so that they at their own front can enjoy the power and thus these external forces or these external exertions should not be underplayed and they should be very well considered and their role definitely is significant specifically if we talk about the naxalism in chatisgarh then the organized extortion racket seldom gets attention now what happens is that if at all the only problem that the naxalists would have was socio economic problems then definitely they would have sought some other ways to cure it but many a times they also extort the people for money and other kinds of advances now definitely that is not something that can really help them but since they enjoy the power they enjoy the money they tend to do such activities and thus such extortion rackets should be seen very carefully also the extensive ideological financial and logistical ecosystem that provides sustenance to these revolutionaries in jungle seldom gets acknowledged now one thing another thing you know that we need to see here that many a times these days specifically in chatisgarh the naxalists or the maoists have become very much advanced they have such technologies which can hardly can be imagined to reach jungle on themselves or by themselves that is why there has to be something or someone which connects these naxalists to the outer world and there is somebody who supplies these technologies these new kinds of weapons guns artillery artilleries etc to these naxalist people and that is why there is an extensive ideological financial as as well as logistical by logistical we mean by various kinds of bombs various kinds of guns equipments weapons etc that are provided and that are actually that actually make this sustenance or the existence of these revolutionaries is possible in the jungle and thus we need to acknowledge this particular fact as well and thus the encounters are labeled as cold blooded murders now whenever the encounters are taken place so what are they actually named as instead of encounters they're called called as the cold blooded murder and ultimately the police officials the crpf or the capf jawans or the black commandos they are the one to be blamed over here so definitely it tries to create a very you know a dark uh, ideology amongst the people who live in these nearby areas now there is another theory which has been put forward which says that uh, all these problems actually are there because of the improper functioning of the ips officers or due to the lack of leadership 
but as per this view the tactical failure against the maoists are entirely due to the poor quality of leadership provided by the ips officers but here we need to pay attention the article says that this view completely ignores many successes or the successful uh, trends or the many successful operations that have been taken place under the ages under the leadership of various ips officers in counter insurgency operations in punjab andhra pradesh uttar pradesh and recently in odisha as well and so it is not just the politics but also the geography and the demography of the naxal affected areas that are the reasons and the factors as well because they are the people who really maybe they do not want to enroll themselves or they don't do not want to club themselves with the outer world and thus they are always trying to create any kinds of problems so that there is disturbance amongst the government officials or with the within the government and the common people with this let's see what do we have for news in flash today Firstly, ex-RBI Governor N. Narasimhan M. Narasimhan passes away. So, former Reserve Bank of India Governor N. Narasimhan has passed away on Tuesday at a Hyderabad hospital following the COVID-related illness. He was 94 years old. So, Narasimhan was the only governor to be appointed from the Reserve Bank cadre. He was the 13th Governor of the RBI and served a short tenure of seven months between May and November 1977 before he was succeeded by I. G. Patel. Second. World Creativity and Innovation Day. So, World Creativity and Innovation Day is celebrated today. That is on April twenty-first every year. Marcy Siegel had founded the World Creativity and Innovation Day. So, this day is a global United Nations Day celebrated to raise awareness around the importance of creativity and innovation in the problem solving, with respect to advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, also known as the Global Goals. Thirdly. World Press Freedom Index 2021. So it has been recently in, uh, introduced, which has been recently released, and this is the ra annual ranking of the countries compiled and published by Reporters with Borders since 2002, based upon the organization's own assessment of the country's press freedom records in the previous year. So in 2021, the countries which ranked the highest on the Press Freedom Index were Norway, Finland, Sweden. Denmark, Costa Rica, the Netherlands, Jamaica, New Zealand, amongst other countries, and India's rank has not been very well, which is one forty-two out of one eighty countries. So this was all for the day. We hope it was a good and informative session for you all. Thank you so much for staying tuned with Lossico, and please subscribe to our channels for such more updates to come.